Hi, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, can chaos and disorder actually make us stronger? We'll speak to best-selling author Nassim Nicholas Taleb. With me in studio, as always, our digital producer, Malika Bilal. Now, throughout the show, she's going to be looking for your comments and questions, so tweet her and use the hashtag AJStream. So, Malika, our community, probably more than most, embraces this idea of a little chaos because it's kind of what social media is built on, a little, little disorder. <laughs> Lisa, that's a really good way to put it. And while they're telling us that they understand and appreciate the concept of anti-fragility, they're asking, how do we implement this in a, in a system that's so fragile? Yeah. So for those of you at home, we want you to send in your questions and join the conversation as well. Use the hashtag AJStream. Shortly we'll be joined by author and academic Nassim Nicholas Taleb and for that reason we have a few extra people hanging out with us in our Google Plus Hangout to discuss his latest book. Thanks to everyone for being here and if you want to join a future hangout just like this add us to your circles on Google Plus. The URL is right there at the bottom of your screen and you could be in the stream. Uh, I'm Samer Arabi. I use Facebook and Twitter to keep up to date on most of the information that I don't normally get in the news, and I'm in the stream. Could chaos benefit us more than stability? Best-selling author Nassim Nicholas Taleb argues that people, governments, and even economic systems can improve through more volatility while developing strengths in the face of unpredictable events. He explains this theory in his latest book, Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From Disorder. Now, in 2007, Taleb wrote the international bestseller, The Black Swan. He is a former Wall Street trader and is currently a professor of risk engineering at New York University's Polytechnic Institute. The same welcome. Hi, thank you for inviting me. We are glad to have you. So, you know, reviews of your latest book have said that it alters modern thinking and it changes the way we view the structure of the world. And I think one of the ways that you do that is through changing our lexicon a bit, your word anti-fragile, you argue it's been missing from vernacular. Explain its place. If, if I were uh, to uh, send a package uh, to uh, China from, from New York, where I am now, and the, the package is a fragile, I would write on it, fragile, handle with care. Mm -hmm. The exact opposite would not be a package that's robust, solid, adaptable, uh, resilient, uh, malleable, uh, strong. No. The opposite of that would be a package that gains from disorder, something on which you would write, please mishandle. <laughs> so the opposite of fragile isn't solid, as people think. It's something. There's a category of object that gains from disorder. And I discovered that a long time ago when I was an option trader. I spent my life you know, as an option trader, my, my, most of my adult life started when I had hair. And, and option traders tend to view the world in two categories. Things that gain from volatility and things that are harmed by volatility. And there's no word in English for things that gain from volatility. And I tried to introduce this. So it took me about 20 years of mulling the concept because, you, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to, to, to try to identify what really gains from disorder. And I also needed to have a, a good definition of fragility. Well, Nassim, option traders have guts of steel. For normal people, disorder scares them. Predictability is not comforting. I mean, most people, they strive yes. to take randomness from their lives and businesses, and governments try to remove it from their systems. Why is this exactly. quite counterintuitive method better? Well. It, it, you know, uh, the, the, there's a big misunderstanding that started, you know, to come about after the Enlightenment. Um, it, it's one of the ills of the Enlightenment. We got a lot of good things from it, but uh, the side effect is that we started looking at the world like a machine. A machine doesn't like volatility. You know, uh, first of all, let me define the fragile as what does not like volatility, doesn't like uh, disruption, doesn't like earthquakes, doesn't like things. So you're you're so. We, we made the mistake of, of, of confusing the engineered with the organic. The organic needs volatility. And, and, and take uh, uh, your body, the human body, if you, uh, you know, spend six months in bed, uh, the human body will be weakened. The, the, the anything, everything organic needs volatility, needs stressors, and that's how the organic communicates with its environment. So the big mistake has been to confuse the organic and the engineered and I call the mistake of, uh, of uh, confusing your cat for a washing machine. 
<laughs> you see, the washing machine doesn't self-heal, your, your body self-heals up to a point, of course. And if you deny the organic, if you deny uh, the organic, the needed volatility and stressor or, or and variations that, 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 that are uh, sort of like uh, part of its essence, th then you kill it. And, and, and this is what uh, people fail to understand. And there's no word for th that category of object that require uh, th these objects that, that require volatility, stressor, some kind of randomness, and even benefit from errors. So y you would be saying then that like small shocks and stressors and disorder, they only really create yes. the illusion of stability. Exactly. I mean, if you, if you spend six months in bed, you're not going to have any problem. You're not, never going to break a limb. But the minute uh, you go outside, uh, you know, of course, you're going to be exposed to germs. And you may not survive an encounter with, uh, you know, after six months in a sterilized room, you may not survive an encounter with, uh, you know, the, with, with, the germ. with other people in the subway, for yeah. example. All so, right, so yeah. I want so you have so the economy. So people think that stabilizing something artificially makes it weaker in the long run. Preventing small forest fires causes the big one to be vastly more exacerbated. It's the same thing with the economy. If you prevent uh, mistakes, if you want to smooth like as Mr. Greenspan did, try to smooth the cycle by having absolutely zero uh, variation. And effectively, Mr. Greenspan would have uh, eliminated the seasons if he could, you know, maintain temperature <laughs> at 68.7 <laughs> degrees. So, so if, you, if you do that, you eventually the, the economy is going to be, be very weak. People don't understand that volatility cleans up the system from the weak material continuously. Okay, so I want to so get into more of these, accumulation these, of harmful things. More of these real world examples. Um, and I want to start with the fiscal cliff yeah, because okay. it seems like we were headed for anti-fragility and then Congress cut it off, right Malika? Exactly, and on Twitter, our community, it's I the have, first thing yeah. that they want to talk about. The scene. there's a couple of tweets I'm going to read okay. you here. This one from Angela, she says, a shift from the monetary system to a resource-based economy is what the world needs. The fiscal cliff is inevitable. And another from Alu who says, I'd love to know how else to avoid the fiscal cliff, if not economic stability. Okay, okay I, I'm not going to comment ex immediately on the fiscal cliff because I'm, you know, it's not it's not one problem; it's a general problem. What mm -hmm. we've we've had since Mr. Greenspan is a stronger federal government and more concentration of errors. So over the past ten years, we made two large mistakes. The first mistake, concentration. Uh, with Mr. Bush, uh, President Bush, you know, who got us into a war that cost between 40 and 140 times estimates. And then the other one is Greenspan, who by, by over-stabilizing the economy made it a lot more fragile. So we made two mistakes. Where do these mistakes come from? They come from, forget fiscal cliff, they come from over-centralization of errors. You want your errors to be spread out. So we need decentralization. And let me explain what an organic system should look like and we can apply it to the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, take the transportation industry. Every, every plane crash makes the next plane crash less likely. You see, so the system learns from its mistakes. It's sort of like what doesn't kill me makes, uh, makes uh, sorry, what kills me makes others stronger. Mm -hmm. The system benefits from mistakes, every mistake. Same with California, with Silicon Valley. The mistakes are recycled to make the system better. So nothing goes in vain. You see, no mistake goes in vain. That's a good system. A bad system is the one we have now, where a bank failure makes the other bank failure, another bank failure, more likely. That's a bad system. It doesn't learn, learn from mistakes, and it's a very fragile system. And this comes, uh, you know, from a combination of things. Number one, more and more federal government with, with more mistakes concentrated in the hands of fewer. And the other one is what I call the moral hazard it is, uh, argument, which is uh, no skin in the game on a part of participants. We're so people get to that tend point to hide no skin on the, the game system. a little bit later because I know there are members of our community that want to talk about yes. that. But I want to go first to someone who wants to ask a question, Marnie. Marnie Chan is speaking to us from New York and she's a journalist and freelancer in our Google Plus Hangout. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm actually very curious Hi. about Nassim's views on uh, social media, um, Twitter in particular. Obviously, um, you know, we've seen as a forum for revolutions or rumors, it's, uh, it pretty much fits your anti-fragile definition uh, to a T. But I've also seen you speak, and I know that you're quite suspicious of, of new ideas and new technology. I think the examples you were saying, um, you know, Greek and Arab philosophy, uh, have stood the test of time and a chair is, is much more of, uh, you know, better technology than possibly your latest smartphone. So how do you reconcile um, the, the theory with, with the behavior? 
And I know you also uh, okay, um, engage in Twitter and, and Facebook and, and forums like this, which are I, I don't. I mean, uh, I, I I don't engage. Sorry, I was uh, other thing. I don't engage in social media too much, except uh, when I have a book, except for uh, one instance in which I only post uh, uh, parts of uh, my writings on on a certain uh, a certain forum. But the, uh, the the problem with high frequency information is that in fact it uh, is very destructive for a system. Too much information is bad because if you if you depend on social media for your uh, source of information you will uh, be completely m mixed up where you get a lot more sensational the ratio of noise to signal is very high so uh, normally in social setting uh, you get uh, you have a natural filter people will talk about something if it's important whereas in front of a computer you don't know what's important and and you tend to have these uh, contagions of nonsense uh, uh, flowing flo flo around. So uh, I have the impression that people understand uh, less and less what's going on, uh, and, and I've sort of model it, uh, uh, modeled it in, in, um, uh, recently. Uh, the more your, 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 your data is high frequency, the, m the less likely you are to know what's going on around you. The same so it's not, I'm not very favorable. Now, I like the web. The web is a great place yeah, if you use it properly. But if you're, to me, the, 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 the information, you probably will get uh, one serious piece of information per month. And, yeah. and, and if, you get, uh, if you're on Twitter and all this, you probably are drowning it and you won't notice it. You see, you, you may miss the elephant in the room. This is why people have, uh, are missing the elephant in the room. There's something I talk about a lot in the book called Less is More. Uh, in the sense that life is not about adding information, life is uh, removing information. When I cross the street, I follow a very simple heuristic. I don't look at the eye color of every person walking around, otherwise I'd be uh, run over by truck. I look for large objects that are moving, two pieces of information. So, so the being on, on, uh, on this high frequency uh, mode is definitely confusing for people. Nate Silver, I think, and, uh, identified it very well. He understood very well that how, how uh, toxic this information can be in his recent works. And the same, I want to shift a bit to the Arab Spring. Do you think that was a predictable event? No, I, I, as a, my, whole, my whole point is that you, 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 you can figure out what is fragile, what's not. And, and I wrote about, uh, uh, even before uh, the Arab Spring, I wrote in, in The Black Swan, I said that there are two kinds of system, political systems. There's one like Syria and Saudi Arabia and the other one like Italy. Uh, Italy is vastly more volatile than, than Syria, and Syria had had the same government for 40 years or so. Italy had 60 post-war governments, but Italy is vastly safer because of variation, because of its volatility, and even added Lebanon as a stable place compared to Syria. And of course, uh, we saw what happened later. Uh, and I wrote an op-ed on, on the Arab Spring by saying it was really caused by overstabilization. Mm -hmm. The United States propping up dictators and you had no volatility, no information. You see, political life likes volatility because it makes all the problems rise up to the surface. They're out in the open and they can be dealt with. The problem is our fear of volatility our fear is, 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 is very bad and is harmful, particularly when you have foreign policy that aims at eliminating all sorts of the variations. Let's go back to Google Plus now. Hugh McLeod wants to speak to us, has a question for you. He's a cartoonist and speaking to us from West Texas. Go ahead, Hugh. Oh, hello, Nassim. Just a question. Um, I've been watching a lot of the, the Middle East via you guys and the BBC. Do you, do you think the, uh, the, the Middle East, the Arab world, and the Middle East around there is getting like more or less anti-fragile because well, I think I think uh, when well, I take a place like Lebanon, mess in Lebanon has been uh, controlled so well because and, and uh, Lebanon appears to be the most dangerous place in the area, and in fact, it's the most stable because all the forces are out in the open. The most dangerous one, I won't tell you which ones, but something similar to Egypt before uh, this revolution, where you have the same government for a long time, zero political volatility. You don't know the forces, uh, you know, deep down. And, uh, and of course, when the, the lid is removed, the thing may explode. So, so this is what I think about the Middle East. I think that uh, places where you have the most political volatility are, are not necessarily the worst places. Ryan, I know that you have a follow-up in our Google Plus Hangout. Ryan Davis, social innovation at Blue State Digital. You're speaking to us from New York. Go ahead, Ryan. I think that the criticism of social media, that it's, that it's just noise, reflects more upon the uh, 
the choices a user makes and who to follow in the same way that I decide to read the New York Times and now the New York Post. That's a decision to, to, to go to a more objective place uh, for information. So I, I disagree that, that social media is just noise. And in fact, I think that there's a, you know, 75% of the world's leaders are on social media, uh, tons of CEOs, tons of authors like yourself who, who, who uh, present information so, so that's really, really valuable. So you, see, you, see, you think that uh, world leaders uh, are not confused by noise or CEOs are not confused by noise? Well, I, I think they're probably not that's, producing that's a, bit, that's, that's a bit problem. <laughs> I think they're probably um, not um, producing um, um, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not quite certain. You see, uh, to, do, to, to, really figure out, to really figure out uh, uh, how useless uh, high uh, frequency information is or how harmful it is, try to read uh, last year's paper. Spend a week reading the corresponding previous year's paper and, and, you'll, and you'll see. These tools are also not There's just a chapter uh, in the it's organizing sorry? as well. It's also organizing as well. I mean, you can look at something like the Arab Spring, which was partially organized over some over a network like Facebook, uh, that, that extends this beyond is, just this the is a, This is here. I, I mean, I, I make no claim. I mean, the 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 the, the I, I don't think anyone can can figure out whether Twitter played a role in the Arab Spring or not. Uh, and I'm certain that if you had Twitter during the French Revolution, they would have attributed uh, the French Revolution to Twitter. You see, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not quite certain. I mean, these things uh, that we we saw them. You have spontaneous formation of uh, anger by crowds. Uh, they go into a forum. Uh, they 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 get organized in, in a natural way, and 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 may, it, Twitter may have helped or maybe not. I'm not going to uh, attribute, make this epiphenomenon, attribution of of, of a certain. Uh, uh, you know, event to what media we had at the time. Nassim, do order and planning hurt the process of discovery and innovation? Well, I, I explained uh, in a book that, that, that people have this, uh, I mean, let me explain antifragility first and, and we'll see. An, an antifragile system or a situation that has more upside than downside from a random event. And, and a fragile situation has more downside than upside from a random event. So the, the hallmark of antifragility is what I call trial and error, you know, where you play with something. You have uh, very little to lose by making a mistake and a lot to gain from, you know, the discovery. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the history of technology, you realize that it's entirely driven, almost entirely, like 99% uh, driven by trial and error. And then later on, uh, the thing gets recycled because we like a narrative and, 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 and written by, by uh, uh, people call science writers, this horrible category of, of people, or uh, <laughs> uh, academics really recycle it. So you try to debunk a few things by doing some uh, uh, rigorous investigation into claims, and I call it lecturing birds how to fly, that effectively most things are de that derived by tri trial and error are later on claimed by academia as being, you know, coming from theory. So in fact, if you look at trial and error, they call the intelligence of antifragility, or I call it convexity in a way, having more upside than downside, mm -hmm. you realize that you can, you can have uh, uh, so much, I mean, you, you, it's like the equivalent of having uh, uh, 2,000 IQ points, you see? Mm -hmm. Most of history, all these discoveries come, and all, you, you need the rigor of, to retain, you know, a, a discovery if it's better than what we had before. We don't even have it. And in spite of that, it looks like, if you look at the history of technology, it looks like, except for pockets here and there, to be bottom-up, tinkering, trial and error driven, and, and trial and error benefits from uncertainty because you're not harmed by an uncertain event and it can be a bonus. So, so this is, and I call it optionality. And, and you can, of course, make a policy based on that. And, and I compare the narrative, the business plan, all of these to getting on a highway with no exits. And uh, tinkering is it's like getting on a highway, but you have so many exits, you can exit whenever you want if you discover something new. So in the book, you talk about these Soviet Harvard delusions with regard to top-down yes. policies. You were just talking about bottom-up. These top-down seems like it would work well on paper. Uh, why doesn't the system work from your perspective? Because a top-down thing isn't based on mistakes. And a system that have worked very well are systems that were able to control and recycle their own mistakes. By having small mistakes, situation, as I explained, yeah. uh, uh, with the airline transportation industry, every mistake is used as fuel for growth. So you use mistakes, volatility, randomness for, as fuel for growth. And, and, and these systems don't like to be controlled top-down. And anything top-down, because Soviet Harvard, because you saw what the Soviet did, control things top-down. And uh, 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 
have a plan and think have this what I call the error of rationalism. Think that that we humans understand everything that's going on, so we could put it all in a plan. Uh, the, the 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 organic nature of things uh, by by recycling mistakes seems to work a lot better. The problem is that it's obvious from you know if you do a, a, a rigorous investigation, it's all obvious, and a lot of people have done it. Not, not just uh, 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 it's not just in my book, but the the problem is that academia wants it's like don't never ask a barber if you need a haircut. Academia is necessarily going to justify itself to overcharge you for education, we, you know, by telling you that you need uh, all these academic uh, uh, you know uh, environments for that. But in fact, things thrive outside academia. The Industrial Revolution or California. Look at it; they're all high school dropouts in California, and not high school dropouts, <laughs> college dropouts. All the big guys. It's the same. Story. Story. It's the same story in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, well, the the same, same I'm going to jump in history. here because some of those big guys have created some of the platforms that our show uses to run under. And of course, our community is picking up on that. Alex says, "Who is?" He, he says, "You're unfortunately seriously misguided about social media." Tip: See Clay Shirky's filter of failure. But while we all ponder that, I want to go back to Google Plus Hangout, and uh, where Josh Blackman has a question. Josh, go ahead. Hi, Nassim. How are you? My question Hi. is, uh, I, I don't see. I don't see that. Yeah. My question is, how can Congress and government learn to pass laws more smart? Very frequently, Congress passes laws in response to the previous disaster, you know, Fannie Mae or Enron. But that law won't prevent the next big disaster, which is something different. Every subsequent disaster is kind of a black swan, which no one can predict it. How can Congress and government learn to make laws more anti-fragile so that they can anticipate and become more resilient with the next disaster, well, rather than just leaving things hanging? Yeah, OK, it, it, unless you have a structure like Switzerland, which was the most successful place in the world, uh, bottom-up decision making, uh, uh, errors are decentralized. Okay, you have the canton, the budget is at a canton level. What's, lo le what's, what's left over goes up to the federal. Uh, we need this bottom-up system in government. Uh, so how can we achieve it? I mean, that was initially how the United States, uh, <laughs> you know, how this country was built. You, you, you need to start uh, uh, by decentralizing as much as possible. And of course, we spoke about skin in the game. People at the local level will have more skin in the game. All right, Nassim, we're going to put this conversation on pause for just a moment and uh, continue it, of course, in our online post show. So if you're not already there, go to stream.aljazeera.com to watch the rest of our program. But before we go, uh, Malika's got a few other stories that the stream is following. Netizens are calling out two U.S. news outlets that reported on a fake fatwa encouraging sexual relations between Syrian women and rebel fighters. News sites Alternet and Salon both published an article on the supposed religious ruling saying it promoted gang rape. The fatwa supposedly permitted temporary marriages between sexually frustrated anti-government fighters in Syria and Syrian women. Both sites later retracted the story and apologized. The religious edict was attributed to the prominent conservative Saudi cleric Mohammed al-Arifi, who took to the web to deny the report, showing a screen grab here, seen on your screen, of the tweeted hoax. In a video posted online, he said the fake tweet had been circulated in his name. Well, many online blamed Islamophobes for promoting the hoax. Ali Abu Nima, who reported on the fabrication on his electronic intifada blog, tweets, with progressive outlets like Alternet disseminating Islamophobic hoaxes, who needs the right wing? Our next lead takes Twitter from a social network to a tool for insect mind control. The Twitter Roach Art Project takes a real cockroach outfitted with remote control and programs its moves to different hashtags like Tweet Roach Left or Tweet Roach Right. All you need to do is send the hashtags to at Tweet Roach. The project was created by artist Brittany Ransom. You can use our hashtag to send us your thoughts too. Tweet us using the hashtag AJStream. Lisa. All right, on Monday, a climate of fear on campus. We examine rising tensions between Jewish and Palestinian solidarity groups at several University of California schools. And we look at accusations of anti-Semitism and censorship. Do universities have the right to limit freedom of speech? Send us your questions and your thoughts on then. And until then, we'll see you online.
Welcome back. This is the post show. It streamed at aljazeera.com and we're talking with author Nassim Nicholas Taleb about his latest book, Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From Disorder. I want to get back to the conversation. Nassim, we've mentioned it a couple of times, this idea of having skin in the game. You know, legislators, bankers, bureaucracies, they're typically not harmed by their own decisions. How do you get these giant groups to have skin in the game? Yeah, the, 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 you cannot, uh, uh, you know, you can't ask uh, people to give up uh, their privilege, having more upside than downside, like bankers. Uh, you, we tried to ask them not to uh, give themselves these large bonuses, and in fact, they insulted us in 2010 by giving themselves the largest bonuses in banking history. So the idea is to have a structure of a system that uh, forces naturally skin in the game. So when you decentralize, politicians will have skin in the game. And I have some heuristics in daily life. In my book, I don't tell people what to do. I tell people what I do. So therefore, if I make a mistake, I'm harmed. Um, same thing in investments. Uh, I don't tell people where, where to invest. I, I don't tell them what I predict. I tell them what I've done, what I'm doing, what exposure I have. So and I, Because I find it unethical to predict without being harmed. You know, you mentioned something, um, we're talking about the bonuses that the bankers gave themselves on the back of taxpayer dollars. I love your theory on how bailouts should actually happen. Why don't you tell our viewers about that? Yeah, uh, my idea is, is that, uh, this is why I was, uh, I'm, I'm sort of have libertarian tendencies, uh, you know, like everybody believes uh, things bottom up, uh, but I don't, don't like the banks uh, to be, to operate the way they operate. So I said, we should have nationalized the banks or um, have a following rule. If you are deemed uh, you know, ba to be bailable out by the taxpayer, should you fail, then automatically you're de facto a civil servant and your employees are all civil servants and you should not pay yourself bonuses. So that would force, that rule would force companies to be small enough not to be bailed out if they fail. And, and, and very small rules like these. This is the one of the rules. Another rule to prevent Washington from playing with us, and I call it Tony Blair rule, is to prevent public office from being an investment policy. So you don't go become a Catholic priest because later on uh, it, it would be good and, and you get a job at Goldman Sachs. You know, you'd be, you know you'd have to, if you go work for the government and at lower pay than, than, than other people in the economy, uh, visibly it should be because you have a sense of mission and you should not be allowed to use it as to leverage it as an investment strategy. Uh, now a very very drastic rule that would give us better uh, civil servants would be to say okay you're not any, any penny you make more than a civil, civil servant after you leave civil service for, should revert to the taxpayer. It's drastic but it will clean up Washington. And Nassim, there's a f several people here that agree with you. Hamza tweets, you hit the issue right on the head. Decentralization of power is key to intelligent, proactive lawmaking. And David says, you have a point. The most best advances have always been thanks to trial and error, business, science, and engineering. Uh, now, there's a follow-up question in our Google Plus Hangout from Marnie. Marnie, go ahead. Uh, hi there. I'm sorry, Malik. I'm not sure which question you're referring to we've had a we're having a go ahead ask, ask whatever's on your mind oh um well i guess i am personally really curious what your views on philanthropy are and how they fit into on what uh, i'm sorry um on philanthropy and how they fit into philanthropy anti-fragile model mm -hmm. Uh, I, 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 don't, I mean, this, this is a, 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 a big problem. I, I didn't address it in my book. Uh, I addressed it in my private life. Um, philanthropy has its dangers because visibly you, you put people, uh, you prevent people from, from having to fight to make a living. So my idea is that we should give a safety net for everyone, uh, particularly when they fail <laughs> as entrepreneurs. We should only give money for people who take risks or to force people to take risks and give risk takers a safety net because we depend on this tinkering and trial and error and we should channel uh, philanthropy that way uh, the but I personally uh, have simple rules uh, like in a book there's a character called Nero and his rule was that he doesn't give a penny to any entity that has any member getting a salary but that was his rule okay and uh, I think he learned it from Fat Tony another one of my characters now that was his rule. May, 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 it could be right or wrong, but that's what he went by. And he never gave money to anyone who asked for it. He gave money to those who didn't ask for it. That was his heuristic. So he had these two simple heuristics um, in the book. 
But I, I didn't really uh, cover the topic of philanthropy. I covered the topic of assistance to entrepreneurs because I think we need to bail out individuals, not corporations. And, and Nassim, we've talked a lot about how anti-fragility can apply to economic systems and corporations and politics, but I think a lot of our viewers are curious, how do they apply anti-fragility to their own lives? I mean, everything, you know, uh, we need, uh, we, you know, we need some a little bit of uh, volatility in things. Anything that gains from a little bit of variation is anti-fragile. So uh, religions understand that very well. They impose fasts, whether Ramadan or uh, I'm Greek Orthodox, so we have a lot of uh, fasts where you, you can't have protein for about 200 days a year or something like that, 170 days a year. So you have, uh, it forces, you have to force variation and, and not have like three meals a day of equivalent, uh, you know, uh, nutritious breaking uh, a routine uh, that's right uh, break your routine uh, have uh, intense periods of uh, workout followed by intense long periods of rest uh, pretty much like our ancestors we're made for an environment that has variability so if you don't have variability in food intake you develop diabetes and now a lot of people have discovered that you need thermal uh, variation like in other words you can't stay spend your whole life at 68 degrees you need uh, to episodes of cold and episodes of heat uh, you need starvation, you need thirst, and, and think about it even from an existential standpoint. No water tastes better than nothing. There's no liquid in the world that money can buy that's better than a glass of water after spending some time in the Sahara Desert, you see, so when you, 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 you're parched. So the, the, the variations in your life, don't fear them, and in fact they make you stronger and, and more stable in the long run. That's what people don't understand. It applies to economic life avoid bailouts, it applies to your own life, uh, don't shoot for mega comfort, and, 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 and I'm discovering more and more things, particularly now that people have been writing to me, a lot of scientists, there's something mathematically called Jensen's inequality, which is when a system gains more from having 50% of a dose one day and 150% the other day than 100% of the dose each day. It's called uh, convex uh, uh, exposure. It's called, uh, and I call it Jensen's inequality. And people are, are giving me uh, examples in, in so many fields that, that now if I had to uh, put a second edition of the book, it'd be 200 pages of these, you know, uh, things that I've discovered after. Where, where, for example, if you look at a wall, uh, you look at modern architecture, it's a smooth wall. It doesn't have a lot of variation. It's not as comforting for your brain as when you look at the lush, uh, uh, you know, uh, forest. Mm -hmm. A lot more information, more variation for the eye, and somehow it's more comfortable. When you walk on a smooth surface, it hurts you. If you walk on a surface of variation, it spreads, uh, you know, it spreads uh, the, the, the stressors, and, and it works better. So, so have more stressors of small stressors, have more episodes of uh, hunger, have more episodes of fast, um, and, and there's a lot of uh, things that uh, in the book about uh, how to control your downside risk. What you need to do is control the extreme risks. And well, let in, a, in an effort to get in a little bit of variation here and maybe a stressor potential, uh, let's go to back to Ryan who has a follow-up. Ryan, go ahead. Um, you know, I think these ideas are great for, for you and Peter Thiel you know, and, and multi-millionaires who are starting innovative organizations. But to, to, to leave uh, the poor in America without a safety net and the poor worldwide without a safety net, when you say episodes of hunger, that means something different to you and me than it does to, to you know, the... the He's not... The, the, he, no, what, what you're saying is sophistry. It makes absolutely zero sense. I'm saying that for yourself have episode of hunger. I'm not saying that you should impose hunger on others. And I, from the beginning, explained to clip the extremes by giving people a safety net. Worry about the very ill, the very, and, and in the book I explain how we should, the problem of over-intervening we have by governments is that they don't intervene enough where it's needed. We have a lot of uh, elective surgeries, a lot of elective medicine, not enough emergency room, and we have, we don't protect the very weak. So, so don't, don't, please don't use my statement about we should have hunger to the fact and attribute my statement to, to my financial condition. I uh, dislike that. Uh, Nassim, we are, we are out of time, yes. but I want to thank you so okay. much for being on our show. Nassim Taleb, New Great. York Times bestselling author and author of the new book, Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From Disorder. Now, coming up on our next program, freedom of speech on campus. We're going to look at tensions between Jewish and Palestinian solidarity groups on University of California campuses. So tweet us your thoughts and your questions on that. And until then, we'll see you online.